Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. In our show this time, we'll take the time to review the top five Think Tech talk shows and the staff pick from a week ago. We'll check out the elements of the best of the best and get a handle on the public issues and coverage involved. Think Tech produces some 30 talk shows every week in our downtown green screen studio. Here's what the studio looks like. And here's a list of our incredible Think Tech hosts. Every week, Think Tech chooses its top five Think Tech talk shows from the week before, based on the number of views each of them has had on the internet. For this past week, the winning shows were as follows. Number one, from the series called Asia in Review, hosted by Lily Ong. It's called Asian and American Educational Systems Compared, with guest Mark Hannington. <laughs> Since I was a child, uh, schools have changed a lot in North America, and a lot more uh, of those issues that are not strictly curricular issues uh, have definitely shown up in the schools, and they need to be addressed. Uh, in the starting with hunger, which now schools need to address. So uh, that's a good point, and it certainly does uh, distract teachers from curricular things. If by curricular things you mean a very narrow set of, uh, you know, what you would expect, as opposed to the broader psychological and psychosocial uh, effects, uh, yeah, I think there's a real disadvantage. I have also heard that in, in China, uh, the teachers actually aren't paid very well as a rule, but make a lot of money uh, tutoring after class. Um, and so that is, of interest to me. It's not feeding somebody, but it's definitely uh, going outside of normal classroom hours to do a, what would appear to be a different form of instruction than took place during the school day. Mm -hmm. And in comparison to Asian schools, how do you think U.S. schools deal with students that are falling behind? Because in Asia, they tend to cash down when they see them gaining a downward momentum. How do American schools in general deal with those? I can't answer in general. Uh, I think a lot of attention is given. Uh, certainly the attention given to children with learning differences has, in, in, the, in the 30 years I've been in the, the States, uh, significantly uh, changed. And, and now we're aware of those. And in all the schools I, I know of, mm -hmm. we have resources. And, and, the, and the classroom teachers are being trained in how do you address this problem if you have you know, one dyslexic child in a classroom of 30? How can you construct a lesson that's not going to lose that child? And so the teachers are getting professional development to help them do that. Uh, so I think we're getting better at it mm -hmm. uh, in America than we have been. Are we as good at it as uh, are in Asia? Probably uh, not, depending on where in Asia you talk about. Singapore and Shanghai have outstanding programs. Well, in sure. Singapore, I mean, schooling is just about mandatory, whereas in the United States, they can opt to drop out. Uh, technically, after age 16, mm -hmm. is, is there an age limit in Singapore? Yeah, well, or you have I'm to just have to finish. Sure. Yes, ideally. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah so it's, it's 16, and uh, well, let me just say, I have uh, two nieces and a nephew who have not gone to college. And they are outstandingly creative and successful. One is a world-class choreographer. One is an expert in computer security. One is a very artistic. So the notion that one size fits all in terms of education uh, is, is also uh, uh, misplaced. Number two from the series called Hispanic Hawaii, hosted by Richard Conception. It's called The Donta Tanner Story, with guest Donta Tanner, of course. <laughs> going to bodybuilding? Well, uh, I originally went to bodybuilding because when I retired from the military, I figured that I wanted to um, gravitate towards a career that engulfed my passions. And fitness was at the top of that list. So uh, I went to bodybuilding because 
quite frankly, I couldn't figure out how to make money in fitness. <laughs> one, one, and I knew bodybuilding was one of those um, sports that 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 um, yielded a lot of attention. It attracted a lot of attention, and I wanted to prove that I can do something. You know, if I'm going into personal training, a lot of people that will be looking for personal trainers are looking to kind of change their their physical appearance. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, hey, if, if I can do the things correctly and do them right and change my own physical appearance, tap into something that I love anyway, fitness, and if I can show people I can do it for myself, maybe that'll give me credibility. And I just kind of started. Did a competition locally, and, and I, I received some success in that. And then I just said, you know, why not? Let's try it for the next level. And they have uh, shows that are pro qualifiers. So here in Hawaii, they have national qualifiers. So if you do well, you get like top three or something, that'll make you nationally qualified. And the national qualifiers can go to a pro qualifier. And if you do well at that, n now you're talking about international. You're competing internationally against people from Mexico, from, uh, um, uh, I went to the one where I was competing, um, all the Americans, so, so um, South America, everywhere, you're competing in one location. So, and I won. <laughs> and I you, That's the key, right? <laughs> all the stars aligned, and I won that competition, and that uh, gave me the um, qualification as a professional athlete. I'm still on cloud nine. I still... I still get butterflies thinking about it. I, I tell you what, uh, I have a lot of goals with it. Uh, I still feel feel uh, nervous about it a little bit. You know, you know, we start thinking about things that are that are goals that seem so lofty. It's like, wow, man, I would never be on a silver screen and, and, and talking and actually portraying another character in a on an international setting. With goals like that gives you butterflies. But to also think back in hindsight, it's like, man, I was just on Hawaii Five O. That's an international show. Why can't I uh, put myself in a position like that? And the thing is, I just said it. When I say put myself in it, I get freaked out because I know I, I can't do it. It takes other things. It takes a positive affirmation. It takes a belief in God or whoever people believe in to be like, okay, you know. Uh, I can't really see a way, but I'm putting out the energy out there, and and team works make dreams work, and things like that. So it's not just me. So Number three from the series called The Cyber Underground, hosted by Dave Stevens. It's called Crack Attack. Our Wi-Fi is broken. With guest Hal Corcoran. <laughs> It's always been that if, I, if you wanted to crack someone's Wi-Fi network password, right, you had, to, you had to lurk around and capture that password when it got, it, it got sent around, around the network and then take it, run it through some kind of password cracker, which would take time, go through brute force or dictionary attacks, trying to guess words until you were able to essentially guess the right password. With, with key reinstallation attacks, don't need it anymore. You don't even need that password. You can insert your own encryption key. So you control the encryption. You can decrypt whatever you want. You don't well, need let's, let's, let's back this up for a minute. For our, for our viewers who don't really know up to this point what we're talking okay. about, well, let's just talk about um, Wi-Fi routers are the central hubs of all Wi-Fi networks. Mm -hmm. And we all trust them. Our, our smartphones use them. Our laptops use them. Uh, all our uh, infer, um, Internet of Things, all the uh, the webcams, everything, they use these Wi-Fi routers. And the Wi-Fi routers usually have some selections for encryption, so they give you some security in your username and password when you log into the Wi-Fi network. And um, you're usually given, I don't know why these still show up, but WEP, or the en encrypted from way back in the 90s, yeah, it's that, still there. That's been broken forever. Broken forever. Uh, TKIP, T-K-I-P, is an option, but broken in 2009. Mm -hmm. So there's still options out there, I don't, and I don't know why. But WPA2 uh, appeared in 2004 and has been around just 
as the standard for all this Wi-Fi for 14 years. All right, I had a marriage that didn't last 14 years, so I everything comes to yeah, an end deal. eventually. You got you gotta you gotta refresh, and especially with cybersecurity, we tell everybody so many times over and over again, it's a running game. You gotta keep moving. The moment you're still for too long. Someone's going to find out how to get to you, and this is one of them. Uh, actually, WPA2, not a bad standard, considering that it held up for 14 years. Yes, That's truly. actually That's a pretty good track record. Solid. Yeah. But it's just inevitable sooner or later with enough people poking at it, you know, you're going to break anything, given enough time and uh, resources. So there was a standard came out from the IEEE, which does all the standards pretty much for all these electronics. Mm -hmm. um, this is, uh, this is a standard that came out in 2000, late 2003, implemented in 2004, I believe, and the, the thing that we're going to be talking about is actually a gap in the actual procedure of executing this standard. Mm -hmm. Somebody didn't think, well, what if this thing happens? What do we do now? And uh, a few, like Windows and iOS, actually thought, well, it's not on the standard, but we're going to do something about it anyway. It wasn't a perfect solution and you can still break it, but at least in Windows and iOS, you're a little safer. Number four from the series called Shrink Wrap, hosted by Steve Katz. It's called The Energy of Fusing Yoga and Therapy with guest Julie Lynn Cato. I was in a child's pose, which is a very uh -huh. resting pose. Yeah. And we were resting, and the teacher said something about, I can't, I don't know word for word, but it was something about you're in the right place, the right time in your life. And I thought, wow, and oh. something just shifted in me. Something opened up where I am, and my hips were open, and so this emotions were kind of more open than normal. My mind was more open because I've been moving my body, and it just sunk in a little bit deeper, and I was like, I am on the right path. And I just started transferring into my life. And when I really got into meditation and yoga, things changed where I didn't react as quickly. I wasn't as stressed out. I was more peaceful. It's calmer. And I probably even started walking with more pride. And I just, something for me definitely clicked for yoga in my life with meditation. Because meditation is a part of yoga. Like you're talking about when you're jogging, then you're mindfully thinking. It's just one point of focus is meditation. And so that's when all of that started shifting, and I knew there was something there that I wanted to infuse with counseling. I noticed that you said um, you stopped reacting. Talk more about that. Yeah, so I, like most people when they're young in 19, 20, when something happened, triggered me or upset me or a family member, I would just react right away. Yeah. Just, you yeah. know tell them how I felt really right. quickly. It never ended up well <laughs> for either one of us. It was never good for either one of us. And I didn't want to do that anymore, but I didn't know how. So when I meditate, it, it teaches me how to just slow down, uh. how to be present, how to be aware of my thoughts. And so that started shifting. And then in yoga poses, the way I like to do my yoga, I use my breath with it. So each movement, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. So I'm learning how to move with my breath as my body is calming down. And so this helps me get a little bit more control over my reaction. So is there a way that when you're not practicing meditation or yoga in a formal way, mm -hmm. that you can remember to mm -hmm. be that way for the rest of your day? Absolutely. This is what I think is beautiful about merging counseling and yoga is that yoga, we're learning how to do it on the mat. We're learning when we're in a pose, what's unaligned, what's tight, what's blocked. We feel it physically. physically, physically. And then in counseling, we're learning that in our mental, in our emotional body. And then, but we learn it physically first. I think people react to things physically first, right? right, right? right. So we're learning it on the mat. And so when we take it off of the mat and we're learning these other tools that we're taught in counseling, we're learning how to cope with them and deal with them in that aspect also. So yeah, definitely counseling fuses with it where you start to realize that you're reacting, you're being shown your triggers, you're understanding your behavior patterns, and you're getting to know your defense mechanisms and you're learning it in that way. But then the yoga part, the meditation part is helping you realize how to bring it all together. Number five. 
from the series called Seymour's World, hosted by Seymour Kazimersky. It's called No More Walls, with guests Taz Vegas and Bobby Pelegi. We hear about music. Music is a tool. I believe that's more than just a door to success and, and um, money. It's more of a, a tool to heal, to inspire, to unite, to bring people together. And what we're trying to do now in our publishing company is try to create a wave of influence from the Aloha State in the form of music and lyrics that can create lasting impression amongst hearts and souls and give certain direction and understanding. And growing up in the 60s, being exposed to artists like Bob Dylan, Marvin Gaye, John Lennon, these, these crafters of music would write songs that would last generations. And when you think about it, the music of today that's out there, not that I'm comparing, is how many songs can you say that you hear on the radio that are going to be lasting 30, 40, 50 years? So what other better way than coming from New York, living on the island of Molokai, and using my experience to influence artists and songwriters to write songs, to craft music that will create a message and one that will resonate in our hearts and give us an understanding of what we're really about. We all want answers. And that's where we came up with the title, No More Walls. So, Taz, tell me a little bit about it. I mean, you have written some Hoku award-winning songs. You're, you're very famous, not just in Hawaii. You work with Hawaiian Airlines around the world. You really wanted to do this. This was one of the, uh, the, the, the big deals for you was to make this song. Tell us about it. Oh, yes. Um, you know, this song, when the song title came to us, it was, and we're not going to lie, it was when um, we seen a little bit of politics going on social media about building walls. And Bobby and I said, well, why don't we write a song about walls? I said, what do you want to call it? He said, no more walls. I said, wow. I said, if we're going to write this, I'm going to relate to it the way it's going to hit me. And the way it relates to me is um, when I hear the title, no more walls, I feel like... Um, it speaks to me about breaking your walls from fear, um, breaking, your, breaking the walls that stop you from going to the next level, whatever it, it is, you know. But for me, that's how I relate to it. And, um, you know, it just, it just transcended into something that the pen to paper, it, the words came. It, you know, some songs, it take a year. Some yes. songs, it'll take five minutes, literally. These are one of the songs that took us no more than a day to write and a, and a day to tweak. We also have a staff pick. This time it was from the series called Research in Manoa, hosted by Pete McGinnis Mark. It was a live broadcast of SOAS Open House at UH Manoa. Today we're demonstrating how we use sonar or sound waves to make maps of the seafloor. So in the ocean, the, this light only penetrates through the top few hundred feet or so. So we can't see anything using light on, in the deeper ocean. So what we do, so what we have over here is a model research ship. On the bottom of that little ship there is a transducer that's emitting sound waves. And then it basically listens for the echo off the seafloor. So based on how long it takes for the sound to get back to the ship, we can say how far away the seafloor is. So we can get depth measurements of the seafloor. And, and John, I, this is important not only if you're trying to do the geology of the ocean floor, but also presumably oceanographers are interested in how deep the ocean is, which would influence ocean circulation. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes. You can also see things like shipwrecks and things like that. You can see... Even, even you can see large schools of fish in the water. The sound will reflect off a large school of fish. So fish finders that people use in lakes and stuff like that.
like that. It's the same technology. And I understand in the Department of Ocean Resources Engineering, there are people who study the acoustic properties of the ocean, trying to infer what the salinity is yes. at various levels or um, what the temperature distribution is. And all of that feeds into the kind of work which you're just describing here. This is Dr. Brian Glazier. Brian, can you tell us a little bit about your exhibit, please? Of course. So over there, they're talking about volcanoes. Here, I've got a model of Loihi, which is our newest volcano coming up off the Big Island. I like to go to Luihi when it's not erupting and take expensive equipment like this with ROVs and understand the chemistry and microbiology of the system. But we also do that around Oahu. So you can go to Sandy's Beach and find where air and water and waves and sand mix together and look like this. Or you can go to Heia Fish Pond in the mangroves and find Knot Beach that looks like this. So Pete, let me get you to have a smell. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very stinky. It's, uh, yeah. What about this one? That's even what That's even. Yeah, yeah, right. So they're both black. There's no air mixing into these. One's really bad. One's kind of bad. What if I told you you could taste salt in this one and no salt in this one? What's the source of the salt? Uh, it must be seawater. Seawater. So different kinds of organisms live in seawater or freshwater and mix. Take a breath. We breathe oxygen, bacteria breathe different things. So what we like to do is build sensors to help us measure the chemistry and the biology of the oceans. And you've got a, another group of students here, so what is it that you're trying to tell them, inspire them to do marine sciences? If you like chemistry, we can understand the chemistry and how that reacts with life. If you don't like chemistry or biology, but you like to be a computer programmer, we need new tools to understand how the science works in the oceans. And back here, they'll be telling you whoo, more about the engineering. And, and, we and we just missed one of the volcanic eruptions, which yeah, we have. Need no, we'll need to watch it. <laughs> you can always find the links to these shows on our daily email advisories. If you don't get our daily email advisories, you can sign up to get them on thinktechhawaii.com. These are only samplings from the top five and the staff pick from our 30 weekly talk shows. There are, of course, many more. To see these shows in their entirety, go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. Great diversity, great community, great content at Think Tech Hawaii. Every day better. And now let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash radio. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. Think Tech is a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our programs, 
Contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during a show, call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. More than ever, ThinkTech lives on the internet. And yes, in our ongoing efforts to push the innovation envelope, ThinkTech is getting into crowdfunding. Here's an example of an animated video on our current Give Thanks to Think Tech fund drive. We hope you'll check it out and that you'll help us on the fund drive. Why don't you tune into thinktechhawaii.com, where community matters. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube, or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Grateful thanks to our underwriters. The Annie Sinclair Knutson Memorial Fund. The Atherton Family Foundation. The Bernice and Conrad Von Ham Fund. Castle and Cook, Hawaii. The Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education. Collateral Analytics. The Cook Foundation the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, Hawaiian Electric Companies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Integrated Security Technologies, Kamehameha Schools, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech. MW Group, the Omidyar Ohana Fund, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Eureka J. Sugimura. Thanks also to our viewers like you. Okay, Elise, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Elise does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii and of course, the ongoing search for innovation wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. Aloha, everyone.